want to thank Snowbird for having us back. Uh, we're honored and, and privileged to be here and, and quite honestly pretty humbled. Um, normally when we speak once, they never ask us back, so we, we got lucky on this one. But um, anyway, I'd like to um, say to Mitch, thank you for painting such a beautiful portrait last night of words and what marriage is supposed to be like. Jennifer, he did good even though you weren't here. But he gave you the credit, girl. So, hey, I want you all to take the time to give the praise band a hand. Are they as awesome or what? And then one other thing, I, I don't know whether you all know the, the interns that served you last night. Um, they really have servants' hearts. And if, if you get a chance, they'll be serving you again tonight. Uh, be sure that you just tell them thank you so much because it really wasn't in their job description for them to be waiting on tables when they came here. So just give them a hug and tell them thanks. They did a great job, and, and we're really grateful for them. So um, let's open up in prayer, all right? Father, we are so grateful to be here. Thank you. We um, ask that um, you let your favor rest on every marriage that's in this room, Father. And Lord, send a revival in our, in our marriages this weekend that we would want them to be and emulate exactly your relationship with you and the church. And so, Lord, we just give you all the praise and the glory. I pray that um, uh, these folks will get something out of um, our mistakes. So we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, all God's people said? Amen. All right. You all did better than last week. I had to ask them twice. So um, the next thing I'd like for you to do is I want everybody to stand up. I'm going, I want you to face each other. Look at each other in the eyes. And then I want you to just give them a big old hug and a big old kiss right on the lips. All right, all right, that's enough. Don't get carried away here. This is a PG-rated program we got going. Um, you know, it's really funny. I was fortunate enough last night, I ran into a couple that looked at me and they said, you, you, you spoke last, last year. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe they actually remembered that. And I said, well, what do you remember out of it? And he said, I remember that one-minute hug that you challenged us to. And so I'm challenging everyone in here every day to hug each other for one minute. Now, there's two caveats. Fully clothed. Fully clothed <laughs> and vertical. So you have to be vertical and fully clothed. But, you know, everybody needs a hug, and it just feels good to kind of wrap your arms around and get one. It's a great way to start the day off. If you're not doing that, I'm going to issue two challenges during this little session, but that's one of them that I'm going to challenge you until next year till we meet again, and, and hopefully somebody will remember it again. But I appreciate you saying that. That made me feel really good. I um, want to uh, put a slide up on the... What do you think about that one? Can you all see it? I, uh, I received this in an email about three weeks ago, and um, I looked at it and I thought, oh my goodness, how true that is. You just wonder how God made two different human beings to be so different as a man and a woman. And about 20 minutes after I got this slide, we received another slide from someone who had uh, made some comments about men and women. And ironically enough, she is one of our neighbors, and she's in the audience this morning. And I've asked her to come up. Connie Hammond. Connie, come up here. Hurry, I'm on a time limit. <laughs> and I want Connie to read to you what she wrote when she uh, saw this, these slides. After I saw the picture, I just realized that that really is how we live. And when Ed saw it, he said, I've heard that before. You didn't write that. That's been around. And I said, no, that's not true. I've told you this before. <laughs> so, 
So I looked at that picture, and my answer to Woody, who also goes to this church, was this. I have to agree. A husband's brain goes straight to one thing at a time. When a husband thinks I'm hungry, he makes a sandwich. Football is on. He turns on the TV. I'm sleepy. He gets up and he goes to bed. But when a wife says I'm hungry, she gets up to see what's available that isn't fattening or that she doesn't need for tomorrow night's dinner. While she's in the kitchen, she notices there are still dishes in the sink to deal with, and you're almost out of bread, which has to be added to the shopping list. While she's making her sandwich, she sees the dog looking at her and stops to give him a treat and wonders when was the last time he got out. So she takes him out. Um, better take him for a walk. When she's sleepy, she gets up to go to bed, just like the husband, but she stops for a drink of water and then notices the dog's bowl needs water too. She checks the locks, she goes upstairs, washes her face, brushes her teeth, flosses, notices she needs to put up clean towels tomorrow. She needs to uh, plug in her phone to charge it. She goes back downstairs to add something to the grocery list, goes back upstairs and puts on hand lotion, checks the time, fluffs the pillow, remembers that she didn't put bread on the list, so she goes back downstairs. But when she gets there, she can't remember why she's there. <laughs> ah, so she goes back upstairs where, of course, she remembers. So she goes back downstairs and adds three more things to the list and goes back upstairs and then wonders why she's not sleepy anymore. <laughs> so. <laughs> you did good. But thank you very much. I just thought that was worth putting in on a marriage conference. Um, and, and Connie, you are just an excellent uh, journalist. I'm here to tell you. So. It's called multitasking. Yeah, that is multitasking. multitasking. You're exactly right. And women are a lot better at it than men. Um, a little bit about Spicy and I. Uh, we have been married 53 years. We met on a blind date. I was 12 at the time. Hmm? I was 12 at the time. She was 12 years old. Um, she gets me off track when she does that. I, I, I try, but uh, it's hard to stay on script. Um, but anyway, we met on a blind date. And um, um, we were together like five days. I was in the Air Force in Biloxi, Mississippi. I'd been home on a boot leave and met her. And um, then I went home for three more days, uh, like in September, I guess it was. And then we decided to get married, and I knew I was going to Vietnam, so um, I told her I was, I was going to be at OJT in Tampa, Florida for about a year, and I'd like for her to go with me. And she said, well, I'm not going with you unless we're married. And I said, no, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm, I want you to marry me. And so... Um, and this was all on the phone, yeah. collect yeah. to me. Well, back, <laughs> I know that you all will not be able to identify with this at all, but we, we lived before there were cell phones. And I uh, actually built two businesses without cell phones. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. But I had to call her collect because I had no way to charge Back then, you could call and say, this call is collect. Do you all remember any of that? No, you do? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I don't feel so bad then. Um, but anyway, I, I can remember asking her to marry me, and she said yes, and I was just so excited about it. And I hung up the phone, and it was midnight uh, because I went to school in Biloxi from 6 o'clock to midnight, and I'd call her right afterwards. And I remember going maybe as far as from here out to the parking lot, and I thought to myself, I don't even know how old she is. And that's the truth. So I turned around and I came back and I, got, I called her collect again. She accepted and I said, look, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be rude here, but I said, you know, I just asked you to marry me and, and I'm, I'm just curious to know, but I don't even know how old you are. And she said, I will be 19 when we get married. I said, okay, Mom, that was... Because I'm thinking, I thought she might say 17 or something. I was going, oh, my goodness. So anyway, uh, November, I came home for about five days. So we were physically together for 13 days 
before we actually got married. So needless to say, we really, other than letters and stuff that we wrote, uh, we didn't even know each other. And so we've had 53 years of learning about each other. 53 years of pressing through, right, Mitch? <laughs> Just keep on. As Mitch said last night, no matter what. And we've had a lot of no matter what's in our marriage. And so anyway, we wound up uh, having two children. Um, and just our heart is for marriages to succeed as God would have them. When he made that, uh, when he created marriage and he wanted to seal it with a covenant, not a contract, um, we just wanted, we just had a heart for folks that were struggling. And believe me, we have not arrived yet, even after all these years. We still struggle. We still make mistakes. And this morning you're going to hear about some of the mistakes we made, and you're then probably going to ask how Spicy ever stayed married to me this long. But at Red Oak and at Snowbird, uh, we're more commonly known because, I don't like to admit this, but we're the oldest people in this room. And so this is Mama Spicy. And I'm Papa John, and you're welcome to call us that. That's what we go by, and we're not members of the mafia or anything like that, okay? <laughs> so, but this morning, how many people in here have ever heard of the love bank? Okay, there is a concept called the love bank, and everyone in this room has a love bank within them. And so... The love that you have for each other is directly affected by almost everything that you do in your behavior. Everything. And every one of those is either you're making a deposit in their love bank, in, in a person's love bank, your spouse's primarily, or you're making a withdrawal, a lot like a checking account. I will tell you that withdrawals are normally a lot bigger than the deposits. So you have to double up on deposits. So deposits might be, if you know what your spouse's love language is, feeding their love language or whatever, but if I, I know what Spices is, and so if I write her a note or I tell her that I love her or that um, she's very important to me, I have made a deposit in her love bank. Does that make sense? Okay. So. If I do something ugly, I make a withdrawal. So I want you to just keep that in mind because when you leave here, um, some of the things that you're going to wind up doing is if you get into confrontations, you may say, well, you know what? That was a withdrawal. And you go, wait, oh, I didn't understand. I, didn't really, I, I said it sarcastically. It wasn't supposed to be a withdrawal. Sarcasm but, is yeah. a withdrawal. Uh, okay, okay, I'm going <laughs> to so, this morning we're going to talk about love busters. And there was a book written by a guy by the name of Willard Harley. He's written several great marriage books, but um, his first one was um, His Needs, Her Needs. And um, then he wrote um, Love Busters, and he said, I wish I'd have written Love Busters first because those are the things that happen in our marriage that bust up a love. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to give you some personal examples of things that we've done, or I've done primarily, uh, to uh, bust up our love in, in our marriage. So a love buster is any habit that makes your spouse feel unloved, unhappy, or is a withdrawal in her love bank. Okay, does that make sense? That's what a love buster is. But first... Let's talk real quick about why did you even bother coming to a marriage conference? Now, I know the main reason is you got away from the kids. You're not, fo you're not fooling anybody. And then you, didn't have to, you don't have to make a meal. That's a good thing. you got somebody to cook for you. Um, and then I, had, I heard last night uh, primarily they like to come for the wreck. So we got, you know, with the aerial park and all the stuff they've got. But I hope that you will come for another reason, and that's to make your marriage more like God designed it to be. And God designed your marriage 
to glorify himself. And so the purpose of a marriage is to glorify God. Now that's, that's saying a lot. It, it truly is. Um, over in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, and Mitch read from this last night. I think it's, You've got, I think you've got a slide that shows that on the board. But it says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And then over in Matthew 19.6, he says, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So God doesn't want us to have divorce in our marriages. Um, divorce affects not only the spouses, and I can tell you that we've seen a lot of divorces in our lifetime, and primarily people get divorced because they're selfish. That's the bottom line. And I, and I hate to say it, but they just go... Uh, it's always amazed me how people say, well, I fell in love, and now I've fallen out of love. So it's kind of like they just flipped a switch, and this is the way it is today. But it extends to your children, to your family, to your workplace, to your friends. I mean, it covers um, all kinds of territory. And it's interesting to note in the study, um, it was brought out that 40% of marriages end in divorce. I've always thought it was higher than that, but the next figure, 20% end in permanent separation until death. So you've got almost 60% of the marriages are no longer marriages uh, by the time people die. The other 20%, there's 20% that live together um, but are independent of each other, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because... Um, in Harley's first book, independent behavior was not one of Love Busters, and then he added it in his latest edition of Love Busters' book. And then the other 20% are the folks that are here. We're happy. Happy in your marriage. Satisfied. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. Marriage uh, is work. It's, n it's not easy. And when you ever start taking your spouse for granted or you think it's going to be easy, you better watch out because the devil is knocking on your door and you're going to walk through some fires. And Spicy and I have been through quite a few fires in our marriage. Fortunately, it's never been infidelity or anything like that, but from jobs to kids to you, you name it, and um, going busted financially, um, we've, we've walked through it all. But you know what? God is sovereign. And when we put him first and we're trying to please him first, then our marriage grows tighter and tighter. And um, I always tell folks, you can love somebody but not like them. And there are days that Spicy does not like John Reidenauer. And quite honestly, there's days I just don't like Spicy. But we love each other. We're committed. And quite honestly, we're at a stage right now where we have freedom and it's just the most wonderful stage that we've ever been in. Other than, I will have to say, the first three weeks of marriage was pretty good. <laughs> so. Only the first three weeks? Well, that's as long as just I can remember in my just. age. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to tell you a couple of places that promote conflict that causes love busters to happen. There's five of them. Uh, the first one are friends and relatives. When you first get married, uh, I don't know whether you all had this in your, your marriage, but um, I told Spicy we were spending Thanksgiving with my folks. I said, and no, she, we're spending Thanksgiving at my house. Yeah. And she said, no, we're spending it at my house. And all of a sudden, uh, we're in what they call the crazy cycle, and we now have an issue. And so for 14 years, we ate two Thanksgiving dinners. And then finally, we got a handle on it. But friends and relatives um, are big causes of conflict. It might be the guys have buddies that they like to go out drinking with, and they neglect their family because of it. Um, another one, number two, would be career choices. 
you, know, you got them on the board there. Career choices and time management. And I, I want to tell you, it's really interesting. Um, I've known a lot of workaholics in my life, and I was one. And um, careers play a big part in that. And it, they take away from your family. They take away from time spent with your spouse. They can actually become a lot more important than what the important things are. And so careers and choices uh, of career choices and time manager are extremely important when you're wanting to have a successful marriage. Financial management and spending, um, you've either got too much money, uh, that may be the case in here, uh, or you may not have enough. Uh, who does the spending in the family? There's usually one spender and there's usually one saver is what we found. Um, but money becomes an extremely big issue uh, in, in a marriage because you're just wanting to survive. And then child discipline. Um, how do we raise our children? How do we, how do we discipline them? And you're going to get some pretty good ideas this afternoon at that breakout uh, that Brody and Little are doing. Um, but do you spank your children? Do you put them in time out? You just let them run wild? How... You need to be on the same page about that, and you need to discuss it before they get between you because kids are pretty smart, and they can manipulate you pretty good real quick. And so, or how are you going to reward them and make them feel special? Uh, all those are things that cause conflict. And then the last one is sex. And usually it's there's, there's too much sex. What are you all laughing about? <laughs> You're too much or too little? You know, in sex, it's, it's kind of interesting. Expectations seem to be the thing that wedges um, dissension uh, in a marriage when, when sex comes up. Uh, we don't like to talk about it. We just like to do it. And we don't like to discuss what we like or don't like or what's good or what's bad. We just want to do it and hope it all works out. And so sex causes a lot of conflict. And expectations uh, lead to that on uh, many, many fronts. So with that being said, there are basically six love busters that we have in marriages, okay? And I've got them up on the board. The first one is selfish demands, disrespectful judgments, angry outbursts, independent behavior, dishonesty, and annoying habits. So we're going to take each one of those, but the first three in there really revolve around abuse and control. And then the last three, they just create uh, incompatibility uh, in, in your marriage. So we're going to take each one of them real quick, and then we'll give you a kind of a personal illustration on each one of them, and we'll run from there. But selfish demands. Commanding your spouse to do something for you that benefits you at your spouse's expense. And that could be something as simple as Spicy's taken off to go to the store. She's got errands to run, and I go, go by the post office and pick the mail up for me. And she's going, pardon me? I mean, was that the right way? Did I make a deposit or a withdrawal? Thank you. I didn't consider her at all in it in her schedule or anything else. Um, paying bills is another one. Uh, who's going to pay the bills? Well, you pay them. Well, we don't have the money. How much money do we have? I mean, it can go all over the place. Um, you're riding on the back of this Harley Davidson I just bought. How do you think that went over? Was that with a withdrawal? We didn't even have a discussion about that one. I just assumed that she wanted to put on some leather pants and we we're going to ride around the country. Um, <laughs> I've got pictures to prove it. Yeah. Um, being a foster parent, Spicy and I were very blessed. We've had 75 newborn babies over a period of 40 years in our home. Now, I want to tell you something. That was Spicy's decision. That wasn't mine. I didn't come home one day and say, hey, I want to be foster parents for newborns. Because what do newborns do? Cry all night. What do newborns do? 
Did I tell you they cry all night? We, and they don't care whether you have to go to work in the morning. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't even interest them whatsoever. They're just hungry. They cry. You need to be there. And this is what my wife chose as a ministry. And so Papa John went along with the program. And uh, actually, I got to ride, ride her coattails. But I'm going to give you an example in our marriage of a selfish demand. When we, we had been married about five years, graduated from college, uh, moved to Tennessee, and we moved into a single-wide uh, mobile home. And we had no money and no furniture, but I did have a job. And um, the guy that I worked for, I told him, I said, I don't have any money to buy any furniture. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go down and tell Jack Reynolds at the bank to loan you $1,500, and you have to pay him back as soon as you can. And I said, okay. So we go to the bank, we get our $1,500, and we drive to Knoxville, Tennessee, and we buy a refrigerator, we bought a couch, a nice rug, a lamp, and um, we were just tickled to death. We got all that for about $750. So we're going out, out of Knoxville, driving out of Knoxville, and we pass a Suzuki motorcycle dealership. And I said, let's just stop here for a minute. I just want to look around. I love motorcycles. And we went in, and we bought a new Suzuki dirt bike, 185, that I could ride in the mountains with the other $750 that we had borrowed to buy furniture with. Is that, okay. the, one, is that with, the one you bought me for Mother's Day? Oh. oh. No, the one I bought her for Mother's Day was a Honda 250 dirt bike. <laughs> and it goes on and, and on, on and on. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm not proud of doing that, but that was a selfish demand. And I didn't ask Spicy about it. She went along with it, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. But I put my wants over what the family really needed. And am I proud of it? No, it makes a good story, but I learned from it. Uh, it took me a long time to learn from it, though, didn't I? So. The next one is disrespectful judgments. And these are attempts to straighten out your spouse's attitudes, beliefs, behavior by trying to impose your will or thinking through lectures, ridicule, threats, or forceful means. Uh, disrespectful judgments are also making a judgment call at a certain period in time that may make your spouse feel extremely uncomfortable. And this one, I'm going to tell you, I'm not real proud of, but uh, I worked for McDonald's hamburgers uh, in their corporate structure, and it was probably one of the best, most fun jobs I ever had. I just loved it. And actually, McDonald's wouldn't be as successful as they are today had I not been there. Uh, I was in their construction and real estate department. And I go to the office one day in Tyson's Corner. We were living in Virginia in my three-piece suit. And um, I'm, I was pretty important. Did I tell you that they wouldn't make it without me? I tell you, okay, I just wanted you to know that. And I get a call about 10.30 or 11 o'clock, and Spicy had gone to the dentist, and they had given her a shot. And it made her uh, dizzy and sick. And so she called me to let, we had two children at the time, and she'd got a girlfriend to watch the kids while she went to the dentist. And she called me and she said, they gave me this shot, and she said, I'm not feeling real good. Um, you know, and I, I'm just not sure what to do. And I said, well, not like a good husband. I said, do you think you can drive the car? And she said, well, yeah, I think. I said, well, why don't you drive home and give me a call and see, uh, and give me a call and let me know you're all right. And I, I, I could just almost feel the wind being sucked out of the phone, but you have to remember I was very important to McDonald's and they couldn't do without me. Why was she calling me? Come get me. She wanted me to come and get her. No matter what, like you said last night, Mitch, I'm going to be there. Well, I was not there for spicy. I'm not proud of it. Okay, that's one of the ones that I'm, not, I'm ashamed of, but I tell you that 
only because don't make the same mistake. Learn from John Ridenour's mistakes. Don't ever tell your wife or your husband when they call and they need you, you need to be there. Disrespectful judgment. How about angry outbursts? This is a deliberate attempt to hurt your spouse because of anger, usually in a form of verbal or it could be even physical attacks, promotes fear within the marriage, and is really not healthy. Uh, it'll almost always end up, when you get in an angry outburst, um, by saying something um, or doing something that's going to last a lifetime or that you're going to regret. Um, is anger wrong? Is it okay to be angry? Sure. But it needs to be a controlled anger and that you're not lashing out at, at the most important person that God ever gave you. And so why would you want to do that? Um, over in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says, Be angry. Do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger. Um, in our marriage, uh, we got I'm I'm the only I'm the only child. Uh, had a good mom and dad, but they were not believers. Um, and for some reason, I was just always angry. And anger, in the form of if something set me off, I just go out and take my knuckle or fist and just hit the hood of the car like that was some kind of a macho thing to do. I mean, it was stupid because it hurt, but I did it. And so we had to really, in our marriage, um, have rules of engagement just like the Navy SEALs have got. And so if we see that things are going south, and this applies even today, uh, we have to take a 30-minute reprieve, and we agree that we're going to meet back at that place in 30 minutes, and that gives me time to process her time to process and me time to get over being angry and then we discuss it openly and put it all on the table that's just for us if you don't have rules of engagement in settling an argument that's going to get steamy you need to come up with some um, spicy had one to kind of temper me uh, in Virginia you remember uh, that yeah he used to come home uh, from work and just have all this anger built up in him and you, I could sense it I could feel it and so um, the Lord gave me this idea of buying him a punching bag so I bought him a punching bag we hung it in the garage and if, when he came home from work then before dinner he would go in he would change his clothes go out in the garage and spend about oh he might last three minutes on a punching bag <laughs> but but you know That's what? That's not funny. It is funny. That, now that was a withdrawal. <laughs> right there. Did you hear that? That was a withdrawal. So, I mean, I was trim and slim. I was in shape. You could still Buffed only up. last three minutes. I could really knock that punching bag around. But you know what, gals? It worked. So sometimes you just have to really just ask the Lord, you know, Lord, how can I help my spouse? Give me an idea that would help uh, lower this anger level and this frustration levels, most of it is frustration. So we found out a way to temper that. And even today, I'm, I'm an activities junkie. I mean, I have to be going and doing things all the time. And I, that just, I'm just motivated by that. And that's why I love uh, snowbirds so much, because there is so much energy for old people in this room. And I appreciate you all for that. But uh, anyway, uh, an anger story that I can tell you about and uh, we hadn't been married but about maybe two three months. Weeks. Three weeks. Three months? Three weeks. Three weeks. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> and um, we lived in a garage apartment in Tampa. I was in the Air Force. And anybody ever heard of spit shine shoes? Well, back then they didn't have um, patent. patent leather shoes. You had to spit shine your shoes and you could spend hours on them. And I had a pair of brogans that, I mean, I tell you, I had those things. They would knock your eyeballs out. And uh, I kept them underneath the bed so they'd be real safe and nobody could step on them. And one morning I sat down on the bed and the slats came out of the bed and the, the frame fell down on my shoes. And do you think I was mad? 
that set me off. And I went into the kitchen where Spicy was, and I put my fist through the end of the cabinet. And didn't hit her, but here's the thing that I did not know. Because when I looked at her, she was as white as a sheet. I'll never forget it. And it was like, she looked at me like, what on earth have I married? This is not good. And remember, we were only together about 13 days before we got married. So we were just learning about each other. What I didn't know is that Spicy came from a family whose father was abusive to her mother, not only verbally, but physically. And so when I put my fist through the end of that cabinet, I'm sure she was saying to herself, what on earth did I marry? Did I marry my dad? And I mean, I'm sure her heart sank. And so needless to say, I had a lot of apologies to do, and it's never happened again. But those are things that you, you never forget, um, and it affects your marriage. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you a story that's over 52 and a half years old, and we, it's still, still there. So watch your anger. That's a love buster, and it'll sure make a withdrawal in, in your spouse's love bank. Now, this one, independent behavior, is one that I told you Harley added. Uh, he originally had five. He added this one. Uh, and, and this is activities of one spouse that are conceived and executed as if the other spouse did not even exist. And usually this will happen when you're angry and you just ignore your spouse. I'm, I'm sure that none of you have ever had that happen or you've ever done that. Um, but, it's, but it can also... Um, it can also cause a lot of friction in a home. 1 Corinthians 11.11 says, However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. And so when God put us together, he put us together as one, not independently. And so tell me, would you think this was an independent behavior if a husband came home and said, Hey, I just bought a house in Tampa and you're going to like it? Yes. Oh, oh. <laughs> now that one I'm not real proud of, but it's across the street from some friends of ours, and uh, I know you're going to like it and you're going to be happy there. Uh, so I did buy a house one time, and only once, without her seeing it and knowing I was going to get it. Um, but an, an, another thing, when I asked Spicy, because I was trying to think about independent behavior in our marriage and an example of it, and and she said, the whole first year you were, you were employed by McDonald's. Not only did you buy me a house without me looking at it, but you were never home in it because you were gone traveling from Monday to Friday. On Saturday, you went to the office. On Sunday after church, we, we went, went to, to church. church. You came home and you started making your plans for the next week. So I had two small children, and I lived in that house that you bought me pretty much by myself. So, so that would be considered independent behavior. I, I, don't, I don't know whether you guys have ever had a job that you just absolutely loved. And, I, I mean, I, I, when I first went with McDonald's, uh, they handed me a briefcase, um, gave me a, a blazer with the McDonald's arch on it, and everybody recognized me, so I was getting recognition. I carried these 25 cent be my guest cards around, and I mean, I was big time Charlie. And, um, and I, I just fell in love with that job. I couldn't wait to get up in the morning to, to, to go to work. And um, so I was working all the time, and I did that for almost a year. Spicy put up with that for a year. And then, I, I don't know, I think God got a hold of me or something, and he just said, you know, what are you doing? This is nuts. And the ironic part about it is... Prayer works. Yeah. <laughs> Prayer works. You're right about that. Um, I, I decided this, this is not healthy. And had she told me during that, that year, you know what, I can't do this. I'm going to take the kids and I'm leaving. I would have probably just said, you know what, that's probably what you need to do. I mean, that's, that's where it had gotten. Because I, I was on a corporate, you know lasered in on a, on a corporate structure. And fortunately, God got a hold of me, and I went to my boss, and I said, I'm going to tell you something. 
I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not working like this. I have to be home on Mondays and Fridays. You own me between Tuesdays and Thursday night, but I'm, I, I, can't, I can't continue this pace. And, and you know what? It's really funny. He looked at me and he said, well, I never asked you to work that long. So I was putting all that pressure on myself just because I wanted to be, quote, quote, what I thought the eyes of the world looked at as successful, whatever success is. Believe me, my eyes of success have changed a whole lot since that period of time. So, men, I'm just telling you that if you are married to a job, your life is going to change when you wake up in the morning and you say, Jesus, I'm working for you today. And what do you want me to do? And he wants you to do your very best where you're at, but he doesn't want you to sacrifice your family. And it's really funny. When I talk to these guys that are workaholics now and I'm, I'm counseling them, I'll get some of them to say, well, I'm, I'm doing it for the family. You know, this is for the family. They, don't, don't they understand how hard I'm working? And the whole time their family's deteriorating. Does that make sense? No, that's stupid. And so, and I tell them that now. I was, I, I'm able to do that because I'm older than they. But anyway, so independent behavior is a, is a big one in your marriage. And, um, and I will tell you, ladies, you can get so hung up with your kids that you forget your husband. And that can happen. And so that's just another way that independent behavior can, can step into your um, into your marriage. Um, I will tell men, don't ever get between a woman and her child. Because if you do, you're going to lose. I'm just telling you that real quick. Um, I think the fifth one is dishonesty. Four types of dishonesty in a marriage. Uh, people lie for protection. They lie to make themselves look better. They lie to avoid trouble that they might have done something and, and they're fixing to get in trouble. And then there's just people who like to lie, see if they can get away with it. And I think in our marriage, probably the biggest dishonesty thing was uh, from us is spicy. Uh, she's not the real communicator. I've had to pull it out of her over the years. She's the stabilizing force. As Mitch said last night, she's the string in our marriage. I'm the wild card or the kite. And, um, but it's hard. She's a pleaser. And so if I say... I don't like confrontation. She doesn't like confrontation. And so sometimes she can be dishonest with me by not saying, this is how I feel about this. Uh, I'm a big boy. I can, I'll, I'll take whatever she tells me or however she feels, and then we can talk it out. But if you hide it and you put it under, I promise you it will come out down the road. And when it comes out, it's going to come out more like a volcano in an eruption than it is, let's sit down and talk about this. Does that make sense? So you got to really, and there's a lot of different kinds of dishonesty. It's, uh, it can run in finances in the home. Um, in fact, there's a lot of it in our home when I get the American Express bill every month. A lot of it's in the closet. And so spicy, to, to avoid confrontation, she just pays the bills and I don't know what's going on. So, I've had that outfit for a long yeah. time. <laughs> or I'll say, I've never seen that outfit. Where'd you get those shoes? She's a shoe holic. You ever met a shoe holic? Got to have. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got one. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> but they got more shoes and boxes. I'm going. What in the world? I mean, I got three pairs of shoes and I get along just fine. Why do you I need all those all shoes? I bought them all half price. So. <laughs> the, the last thing is annoying habits. Uh, these are behaviors repeated without much thought that it bothers your spouse. Now, sadly to say, this primarily pertains to men. Now, I'm going to tell you why that is, because men and women are really wired like those railroad tracks that we saw earlier. And men can th compartmentalize their thoughts. Women, they think globally. They've got a million things going on at one time. I'm going to give you an example. Women, have you ever asked your husband, what are you thinking? And he says, nothing. And the, you go, no, 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 you've got to be thinking about something. No, no, I'm thinking about nothing. 
a man, a woman goes, you can't think nothing because a woman can't think of nothing. But trust me, women, men can think of nothing. Okay? And so you, that's just the way God made us. And, you know, I'm not going to question him. I'm just going to live with it and pray through it. That's what you have to do. But um, it's really funny how God puts opposites together like that. Uh, but annoying behaviors can be something as little as squeezing the toothpaste from the middle instead of the bottom. It could be... Crunching ice. Yeah, who does that in our family? That would be me. Cost you a couple of crowns, but I love ice. Um, toilet paper coming out the bottom or over the top. Some folks don't care. You could, it'd be, it, you could escalate that a little bit, and you could be, well, being late for everything. Or going to the other extreme, being anal about everything. It's got to have its place. But these little behaviors are things that you need to discuss and get them, get them out in the open. And it all boils down, folks, to communication. You can avoid love busters by just communicating. And by discussing, you made a withdrawal in my love bank. Or you made a deposit. You know, we like encouragement. And so find out what your spouse's love language is. Feed that love language. Parlay off of it. Don't try to feed her love, her love bank with your love language. Or remember that when you're speaking, she has pink hearing aids and a pink microphone. I have a blue microphone and blue hearing aids. So we hear things differently. We... Uh, say things differently, uh, and we take things differently. And so, but it's extremely important um, that we talk about these to get rid of these love busters. Um, choose humility in your marriage. Choose humility in order to avoid the love busters. And be in agreement when you make big decisions. In closing, I want to um, mention the three types of intimacy that we have in a marriage. Um, there is the physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, and spiritual intimacy. Now, physical intimacy, we can... Everybody kind of know what I'm talking about, physical intimacy? Is that sex? Oh, okay, sex and affection. So... Harley wrote a book in His Needs, Her Needs, and man's number one need is sexual fulfillment. That's what he thinks about. And I know Brody mentioned in one of his sermons, I thought it was pretty appropriate for a sermon, but he said, when I first started to get married, I thought marriage was just being naked for the first six months <laughs> from 5 o'clock in the afternoon till 5 o'clock in the morning. Do you remember that, Brody? You probably don't even remember saying that. Well, he, he said it. I was there. I'm, I'm a witness. But when Harley said that that man's number one need uh, and a woman's number one need is affection, I mean, when I read that, I thought, man, this is awesome. Because I thought affection and sex were the same thing. And I'm going to tell you something. They are as far from one end of the spectrum to the other. And you need to know that, men, because I think there is affection in having sex, but women, affection is a whole different thing. And it can be just the tone of your voice. And we don't think that way. We're just not wired that way. So um, emotional intimacy is when we're on the same page going through life, but we're thinking of what our spouse is going to think about this first. If I go out and buy this house, am I being considerate of a spicy? No, I won't buy it without talking to her. But thinking about them first before our own, own wants or needs. And then spiritual intimacy. What, what is a picture of spiritual intimacy? Look, any, anybody have any ideas? What would you think spiritual intimacy would look like? Pardon me? All right, good. How about praying together? 
If I took a survey in here, and I'm not going to do it because I think there would be a bunch of folks that are embarrassed, but I'd say how many of you are you're believers, you love Jesus, he's the number one thing in your life, how many of you all are praying together? Now, I usually ask, thank you, and I'm glad. Um, if I ask the men in here, are you praying with your wife, the number one answer would be, well, not enough. My second question is, well, how much is enough? And then they go, well, I'm not real sure. You know? And that's a determination for you. But I'm going to encourage you. I said there was two challenges. One was give each other a hug for 60 seconds a day, vertical and fully clothed. And number two is that you pray together. And praying together, it just amazes me how many people say, well, you know, it's really awkward to pray together. I just, you know, I said, awkward? What do you mean awkward? You use this woman's toothpaste, toothbrush, you go to bed with her naked, and you're talking about being awkward because you're praying? <laughs> Give me a break. That would be awkward, you know, but not praying together. And so I'll, I want to encourage you, sometime during your busy, busy day, uh, you, we have time and we, we put on our schedule to do everything else in the world. I want you to just take two minutes. That's all I'm asking. Two minutes out of your busy day and pray together. And it might just look as simple as, Lord, put your hedge of protection around my wife and my family. You know, keep them free from any danger or harm or outside demonic forces. When I go out into the world, I want her prayers to surround me. I want to be protected by her prayers. And I want the favor of God to rest on my marriage and my family. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. And I think it starts in your marriages to have a stronger marriage. And do you realize how big a smile you put on God's face when you pray to him together? And he sees his two children praying together. I mean, he is ecstatic about that. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Two challenges. And with that. Can, um, I, can I just give yeah. the guys a word from, from an old woman? <laughs> I want to encourage you to really consider making a habit of standing in the morning or in the, at evening and holding your wife's hands and just saying, let me pray for you, and would you please pray for me? Uh, it's a great way to start the morning. It's, it makes your wife feel loved. It, it really shows affection. Um, it makes her feel secure in knowing that you are concerned about her day, that you are concerned enough to take it to the Lord, and it just does wonders in your marriage because I will tell you that there's been plenty of times I have been so upset with John because I thought he wasn't thinking about something that I was very concerned about. And I was, my fuse was up here. And when we would pray together and he would speak to it in prayer to the Lord, guess what happened? That fuse just went way down. So it's just... I cannot encourage you enough, guys, that it's your responsibility. She should not have to ask you to pray with her and that it will just go a long way. And you know what? It feels awkward because Satan wants it to feel awkward. I'm done. I mean, all I can say is amen to that. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here and allowing us to share with you. I hope that there's some of our mistakes uh, would make your marriage better and that you can learn from them. And uh, I'm just grateful, uh, both of us are, we're humbled and grateful to have the opportunity to share with you uh, at our age especially. Uh, we're, just, we're just blessed. And so I thank you so much. Brody, I'll turn it over to you.